we already mentioned uh, ecological debt. Uh, let's also do the carbon debts and credits uh, first. So these are policy alternatives and alternative visions to see what climate justice may look like. Okay. So uh, as we said before, if you look at the emissions from the time of the Industrial Revolution, because that's what brought us this uh, global warming, climate change, climate disruption uh, issue. Uh, obviously, uh, this is showing now total carbon debt if you go from 1990 to 2013, so more recent period because globally it was agreed upon that the rich countries emitted a lot, but they didn't know that this was bad. Only in 1990, uh, UNFCC and so on, and the science that came with it, Jim Hansen giving uh, testimony to the Congress, US Congress, saying global warming is here, Wally Broker's warning early a decade before, uh, Uncle Ramanathan had papers arguing about global warming in the early 1980s and so on. Um, so 1990 to 2013 versus 1960 to 2013. You can go back even to 1850 and this will get uh, even worse. Okay, So these are countries which have a uh, carbon debt because they have been dis emitting most of the carbon that's in the atmosphere. So I think I mentioned already you have to worry about the greenhouse gas concentration, their residence time, once you put it in the atmosphere, how long do they stay there, and their global warming potential, how powerful they are in terms of trapping the outgoing long wave radiation and creating warming, right? CO2 has a very long residence time of multiple centuries to a thousand years depending on various factors. So it accumulates. That's the main thing to remember. As opposed to methane, which has got only a residence time of a decade, water just a few days, and so on. N2O has much longer, but nonetheless, N2O is in parts per billion, whereas carbon dioxide is in parts per million. Those things also have to be remembered in terms of concentration. Okay, so there is United States, the king, United States, the king of all carbon debt country. Uh, Russian Federation, Japan, obviously corresponds to industrialization and wealth. And then here you have China, Brazil, Nigeria, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and India. So there is their uh, carbon credit. Okay, so positive or negative. Uh, you can think of it as debts and credits, right? So essentially these countries haven't historically contributed even going back to 1960s. Hence, can we find a way to transfer the debt payments from here to the people who uh, are credited, who need to be credited? Okay, that's a fairly straightforward uh, concept. Ecological debt is a little bit more complicated, but nonetheless you can see here that you can think again of ecological footprint exceeding biocapacity. You take each acre of land and you compute its biocapacity and you look at how much you are consuming your ecological footprint and then you take the difference to see that again many of the rich countries are in ecological debt. Okay, so here you are ecological footprint versus biocapacity. So if you have these colors, that means your ecological footprint is exceeding biocapacity by various percentages based on the color, uh, up to 50%, 50 to 100, 100 to 150, or more than 150. So you can see that China and India also show up as exceeding their biocapacity because they have big uh, population, but also remember that these countries have been inhabited for many, many millennia whereas these are heavily populated after colonization, like Australia. The Aborigines and the natives lived there, but their population was tiny and they were not uh, exploiting the resources as heavily as the colonizers that came and industrialized the places. Okay? Nonetheless, you can see large parts of Africa is well below its biological capacities but they are disproportionately facing climate impacts and climate, uh, sorry, this is South America, this is uh, Africa. You can see Africa also has many countries that are well within their uh, biocapacity. And um, 
there are many African countries which are uh, in the desert area which don't have much of a biocapacity but they have population so they have exceeded the uh, biocapacity as well so they are also in ecological debt okay these are important concepts uh, the key is how to convert them into policies so that when it comes to policies there is a big consortium now which includes uh, associations or entities like uh, World Resource Institute, Nature Conservancy, along with uh, and the Environmental Defense Fund, along with fossil fuel companies like DuPont, Chevron, uh, PGE, Procter Gamble, and somebody else, I'm sure, Unilever, Citibank, Ford, etc. They are all uh, proposing market-based solutions. Um, many, many entities, NGOs, environmental uh, agencies and uh, environmental associations, groups are not happy with this idea because they think there is a fundamental disconnect between the way economic forces and market forces and market-based economies work and the idea of saving the environment or reducing environmental footprint. They think all economic activities are basically geared towards exploiting the environment, converting things irreversibly into um, junk that cannot be recycled and so on. Nonetheless, as, pan as the pandemic shows, as w I argued before, unless climate uh, solutions, climate justice, environmental uh, solutions are part of the economic activity in terms of providing employment for people you can call it green technology or whatever unless they can offer solutions it will be hard to convince people to simply give up things we cannot just say don't do this don't do that without saying what the alternatives are right when people are worried about where the next meal would come from if you say you working your work your lifestyle your food your travel everything affects the environment where you don't say how they can manage to do at least some of those things and still save the environment there is not going to be a solution so policies and action plans uh, agreements have to somehow take care of the market forces so market-based economy can be an important player it, capitalism may be the most consistent with human innovation and as somebody has said democracy is the most consistent with human dignity so how to balance those things